Tony Asaro, SVP of Strategy and Business Development. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on hybrid cloud NAS and multi-cloud NAS storage, as well as multi-data center as well. So Jen, just to reiterate about the global data environment, the global data environment can, consists of multiple uh, areas, uh, our global file system, our data orchestration capability, uh, and our ability to integrate with, uh, with higher layer uh, applications. So one of the main use cases that we're seeing with customers is burst for compute, uh, where they might have uh, workloads that require a lot of compute power. Uh, for example, and I'm gonna use this use case uh, that, uh, that our customers are using. Uh, in rendering movies, uh, it takes millions of files in order to render these movies and can take uh, uh, between 50,000 and 100,000 cores in order to render a two hour movie. Now, rendering that two hour movie with that much compute, oftentimes uh, the uh, customers do not have that much compute in their own environment. So they're using the cloud for that. Uh, but using the cloud to render a two hour movie can cost literally a million dollars in power and cooling costs. So with Hammerspace, they are able to move that workload uh, to a region in the cloud that has much lower power and cooling costs. Uh, this customer literally will save $250,000 per render job. And oftentimes they have to run multiple render jobs. Uh, they easily run 20 render jobs a year. So it can save them millions of dollars just by moving those workloads to lower cost power and cooling regions of the cloud. And this is not point to point. You can move this to any location. If Denver isn't available because somebody else is using those compute resources, then move it to Toronto. And Toronto doesn't have to be a cloud. Maybe you have your compute farm in a data center in Toronto. Or if that's not available, Tony, so, move it to so Jacksonville. Yeah, go ahead. Part of the challenge with this is that the data needs to be accessible to those locations at a fairly decent clip performance-wise. Yeah, you can move the workload, the, the compute to anywhere in the world, but the data still has to kind of be accessible to those places at uh, a reasonable latency, a reasonable It's a Good very point. fair point. Um, and so that's why um, in these environments, these are part of a planned uh, transaction uh, so that they are, it's all part of the, the workflow. Uh, however, uh, in the case of uh, this one particular customer that we're working with, uh, and uh, they've got um, capabilities to use the uh, cloud network to move the data over high bandwidth high bandwidth networks uh, into their environments. So uh, it tends to uh, overcome some of those uh, performance limitations as well. Can it move in mid render? Uh, we can actually move uh, live uh, and transparently. So yes, it can move in mid render. Now we've integrated with uh, ShotGrid, uh, Autodesk ShotGrid, so that uh, this actually with our API integration uh, is a drop down menu with all of the different uh, locations in the cloud that they can move data to. So, literally, a production manager does not have to involve IT in order to do this process. Now, obviously, they put guardrails around it, uh, but uh, you can actually just go through that drop down menu, pick which area of the cloud you want to send the data to, and then it get automatically sent there uh, via shot grid. So let's talk about hybrid cloud NAS. So the majority of, of our customers are using us uh, in some sort of cloud environment. Uh, the typical um, uh, hybrid cloud model is uh, typically a, a hot tier, a warm tier, and a cold tier, putting data into a single bucket in the cloud. Uh, with our data orchestration capabilities, uh, we actually can support multiple buckets in the cloud so that you might want to be able to separate things by availability zone. Maybe you want a full copy in different availability zones, or maybe you want to divide it up and say, well, look, I want half of my files in one availability zone and another half in the other. Uh, or I might want to say, I want some of my data in different regions uh, for redundancy and availability, or perhaps I want to have multiple cloud scenarios because uh, I don't want to be stuck with one cloud. So we can support multiple uh, buckets, clouds, uh, environment, and it all becomes a single pool to us. Uh, in that environment. You might also want to move data for locality uh, so that uh, you make sure that the people who are in Chicago uh, are storing the data they need in a region of the cloud in Chicago, uh, or perhaps in Taiwan or in, uh, in Texas or wherever it uh, happens to be. This is not just uh, relegated to the cloud. If you've got object storage and have a private cloud, we can also do that as well. So whereas most other solutions in a hybrid cloud model can store data in a single bucket, we can literally support over a hundred buckets uh, that you, or volumes that you can store data on. And all of that is abstracted away from the users and the applications. Uh, they just know they need to access Hammerspace and then ha Hammerspace will make sure that the data is available to them. And also if a single part of the region is down and it's not available, we will then uh, get the data 
from the lo closest location if there's another copy of it. So as long as there is another a copy of the data somewhere in this environment, we will serve it to the uh, users and to the applications. So on the data movement in that kind of a situation, mm -hmm. is Hammerspace <clears throat> doing some observation telemetry to determine what the fastest paths are to the various different copies of the data that are out there? That is correct. So that's no admin usage of saying this is a, a four gig line, this is a 10 gig line, this is whatever, it's just it will figure out what the yeah. shortest path to get there is? Yeah, that's what the telemetry is, uh, is there for, to, to gather those statistics and make those decisions. Does Perfect. it do any cost analysis on moving that data around? Yes, it's a financial arbitrage, so we uh, we factor in cost as well. So, are you supporting some sort of erasure code across data centers? Yeah. So, in the uh, obviously in the object store, there's erasure coding uh, and and leveraging that uh, from an object store point of view. In the native file system, we do not have erasure coding today, but that is in the roadmap. Expect that to be later this year uh, to support erasure coding uh, in within data centers and across data centers. At the, at the file system layer, we, uh, we support it in the object layer today. We have a number of customers that aren't using the cloud um, because- do you, do you have any protocol in place that'll uh, basically, if it starts pinging around uh, and then that area that it moves to is not, it worked at first, but now it's, now it's down or something like that. And then uh, do you have any protocols in place to kind of say, hey, Let's stop, let's stop moving this around until we can figure out where to go. That's correct. So if a site goes down, and again, we are built for sites going down, right? So if that site is, not, is, is, uh, is unavailable, then we won't go to that site anymore. Again, part of our ability to uh, orchestrate data and understand everything that's going on in our global file system. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking more about read, too many redirections. Right. If it, if it keeps redirecting, is, uh, is there some, something in place that'll they'll say, hey, you know, Let's stop moving this file until we figure out where things are going. I'm not quite sure what you mean with redirection. Could, could you? Um... So you have right now, let's say you have a data center in New York and uh, and, you, and the data center is going to move to, Pro the, the data is going to move to Prague, but then Prague, uh, Prague either goes down or, or, or the, uh, or there's too much uh, uh, traffic going through so then it decides so let's move over to Canada and then that's that's going through and it just it just doesn't find the final place to rest is there going to be a, alerts or anything like that that's saying hey this data is just moving around in way too many directions yeah so I mean there, there absolutely there's there's alerting but I, I don't think that that situation would occur because by default we will always try to make sure the data is on on, on two volumes you can also use objectives. So, so for example, if you wanted to set up a DR configuration, you can, there are two ways data can move. Data can move through instantiation, which means that data is delivered on demand. I, cre I create a file in New York. Somebody wants to read the file in Singapore. The data is automatically moved over on demand. It's instantiated. It's always visible and available through metadata, but it's instantiated. Now you can make the data available through declarative policy, what we call objectives. And that is how I would do it. And that's certainly best practice for DR. So let's say I have three sites. I wanna make sure that there are two copies of that data. Now that happens by default, but there are various ways I may to augment DR to make sure that that is, data is replicated in, in multiple places. So to answer your question a little bit more too, is that in other words, we aren't necessarily just trying to find a home for the data someplace so that we're not saying, okay, if site A is not available, send it to site B and so on and so forth. And what the metadata servers do is that they will asynchronously update, uh, every, default is every five seconds to update, to make sure that everybody is updated with the, the latest changes that occurred. If a single site is down for a little while, uh, everything else in the global file system will keep operating and when that site comes back up, then we will uh, update it with all the changes that occurred in the time that they were down. But we don't have the scenario where we thrash to a single site or multiple sites and say, hey, you know, somebody's got to stop this or, or cry foul. Um, so yeah. it's a good question. I'm going to explore that a little bit more. And it's not going to get stuck in limbo somewhere. No. 
So uh, we have customers that aren't using the cloud at all. So um, while the cloud is very popular uh, and increasing in popularity, um, we have certain uh, in, in verticals that don't want to use the cloud because of corporate governance uh, and their and their own regulations. Uh, so we we do have a number of customers that are using us for multi data center. So again, very similar, right? We create policies in which uh, data is uh, replicated to uh, locations. Uh, again, part of a workflow, part of follow the sun, uh, part of a, a pipeline process, etc. Uh, and those that data will automatically move based on your follow the sun policies or other triggers in the in the workflow uh, to be uh, easily accessible all over the world. We have customers that are generating massive amounts of files uh, in their process uh, that uh, that you know goes through different stages of operations, uh, and uh, and so they need to be uh, accessed everywhere. This is not point to point. Uh, this data can move to any of these locations uh, at uh, based on the objectives that we were talking about, which is another critical uh, use case for us uh, that we're finding customers that are doing this for data centers. Uh, this could be for, as I said, to develop files that are collaborative throughout the entire environment. Uh, it could be because people want to have uh, disaster recovery. In some cases, it's part of a distributed workforce uh, that Molly's going to be talking about, and that distributed workforce uh, could be leveraging data centers that they are close to around the globe as well. And in this so, case, you said that you have a, C a Kubernetes CSI plugin. Yes. So this would fit very, very nicely with the data side of Kubernetes uh, disaster recovery. Exactly. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, that's critical to it because, uh, again, we can make multiple copies. We can put them in the cloud. We can put them in different geos. Uh, it works very elegantly in a Kubernetes environment. Um, so fundamentally, we're we're eliminating data gravity. Uh, as long as it's uh, in our file system, our namespace, we are no longer bounded by physical infrastructure, location. Uh, et cetera. Um, and, uh, and we're very focused on high performance. They have to think about performance in a new way, right? It's not just about measuring IOPS, it's not just about measuring throughput. Those things are fu fundamentally important and they always will be, but you also get performance by making sure the data that you need is local to you. So it's also about getting the data, regardless if it's part of an enterprise file system that has billions of files, making sure you get the right files uh, even before you need them. Uh, so performance has another metrics now as well, but we're also very concerned about the critical uh, um, aspects that we've always uh, come accustomed to. Uh, and then, you know, being able to also impact the economies as well. Uh, we literally have customers that are telling us that they are getting projects that they would not have gotten otherwise, if not for our ability to get data to the various locations, uh, that they are able to increase their uh, uh, profit margins because they can uh, use their data and render their data or simulate their data uh, in, uh, for much lower cost as well. And then, as someone pointed out, to automate as much of this as possible. When you're thinking about scales, you know, one or two files is fine, but when you're thinking about scales of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, or millions of files, and automating the orchestration of that to multiple locations, doing that manually is probably, uh, I would say impossible, but it's, it's, it's certainly improbable. Uh, so you have to automate this as, as much as you possibly can.